Hello? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Gustavo Teles. Um, uh, I'm a uh, researcher at the University of Sao Paulo uh, in Sao Carlos. Um, and I'm here today to speak about uh, an interesting process we found a few years back of the decay of multi-charged vortices in our BCs. So first of all, I'd like to thank the professors Ortiz and Mario Doria for inviting me and the funding agencies which keep us uh, on the field. So uh, first, I'd like to show you a little bit <coughs> of the outline. I intend to uh, present you a little bit of the uh, charged vortex, the nucleation, uh, our experimental setup, the topological imprinting method that we use, and the results we have obtained so far, uh, which I hope uh, will be interesting enough. Uh, when a little bit of the uh, challenges we had when we were uh, preparing or investigating this. And if I had some time, I will explain a little bit how we're going to go about it. So um, the idea is the following. So as you most of you know, uh, when you have circulation in these BCs, uh, the quantization or the circulation in the system is quantized. And now we're going to be speaking about a uh, different uh, vorticity state, which we call, uh, which we name as a kappa, we use here, uh, which is in this presentation larger than one, which is different from the previous results, mainly presented along the first decade of this uh, century, yeah, there was quite some interesting after a, a Japanese group presented a basic way of how to introduce a circulation in the system without actually steering the BC as the previous result or a phase engineering where, um, where you get the angular momentum imprinted from the, uh, directly from an optical beam. So uh, is it on? Can I continue? Yeah, okay. So um, shortly after, it was experimentally observed in MIT, and it, it has been sort of a, a follow-up. Shortly after you have an experimental result, you have a more theoretical to explain. And this uh, went on and on from first using charge two vortices and then later on at charge four vortices up to 2010, when it apparently it didn't get much interest from the community anymore until I guess right now where we're starting to see some interesting difference between this previous results and ours. So um, it happened a little bit by a chance. So we were in the lab uh, trying to, so as you've heard from Professor Bagnato, the first talk, um, uh, one of the main interests in the group was to produce, uh, uh, sorry, to produce turbulence in the system. And we were using one technique where we, we set up a coil pair and then we, we introduce an oscillation in the current and we drive the system to the turbulent state. It turned out that the, this method or this recipe, if you like, is not uh, so simple to reproduce. So we got a little bit of stuck at after some point around 2011 and 12. And we decided to investigate a little bit, uh, sort of a hint that those first papers left behind, uh, where they suggested that, well, if you look at a little bit of those results, you will see that people were only investigating the system by taking pictures or snapshots along the uh, actual or the symmetry axis, where you got this kind of pictures or um, density mapping of the system which doesn't reveal all the, the features that you can see here, this three-dimension um, decay process, which could be quite complex. And uh, it already suggested in many of the theoretical papers that you should see something like that, that we call generally as an unwinding of the vortex while they're decaying. So not only the core, the core size and the, the dynamics of this uh, should be investigated, but also how they decay, because the, those, those previous uh, ex uh, results were only presenting a split that was much simpler, something that only you start with a large, larger core, and then eventually you have this, and that's all that happens, like a linear split of that. So we decided to check that out. 
So uh, since we are a little bit away, I'm just going to show you quickly how we, we go about it. We have a system which is mainly a vacuum system, not so far, it's like one and a half meter more or less. We have two chambers, one for pre-cooling and the other, we call it the science chamber. We have a differential vacuum here going for high, from high vacuum to ultra high vacuum for, for increasing our lifetime so we have time enough to investigate our BECs. And, and get clean results of whatever. So if you zoom in a little bit around this region here, uh, what we see is our trap. We use, we produce our rubidium 87 BCs using a magnetic trap which comprised of these three coils here, okay? A quadrupole coil created by this coil pair here along the vertical axis and plus a tapered coil um, which is placed on the side and morphs this field from the typical uh, V-shaped quadrupolar field to something that is more harmonic on the bottom and where we make, we produce our condensate and start these studies over here. These two coils were used in the past to produce the turbulence and the turbulent results that pr Professor Benato um, presented earlier. But here we had to really f uh, carefully align them on actual to produce the bias inversion, which I'll be talking more later on. So how do we produce these vortices, or how people came up with this idea in our system? So basically, what you have is, if you zoom in, on the bottom of our magnetic trap, we have uh, this typical harmonic profile. That's where the condensation occurs. And that combination of coils also produce produces uh, a magnetic bias which points towards one of the coils, the, the tapered coil, to be more specifically. So uh, the Japanese group came up with this idea that if you carefully uh, um, invert this field over in, a, in an adiabatic fashion from the B0 to minus B0, uh, you will end up with a winding in the phase which will produce the vortex or the large vortex in the set. Of course, it depends on the state, on the atomic states, and we profit for, for that. That's why we decided to try, okay? But it also morphs a little bit our trapping potential to something that looks like this along the, the actual direction, uh, meaning that it is a little bit anti-trapping <laughs> when we end up the process. So we, don't, uh, we cannot hold our BCs in that situation for long, okay? Um, so a little bit more, so here uh, I think I already showed you what happens while we were inverting the fields. Uh, on the radio direction, we don't have anything weird happening. It continues just like a parabolic and it's trapping in the end. So in the end we have something that traps along the, the direction pointing towards the screen, but it's anti a little bit anti-trapping uh, along the actual the symmetry axis. Um, so the recipe we came about was more or less like this. We started our rubidium BC, we produced them in the F2, MF plus 2 state, which is the most trapping, uh, most, uh, the, the stronger trapping occurs when you, when you pump your atoms in the substate. And then we, we, we run this inversion bias ramp going from typically plus 0.5 or 0.6 Gauss to minus 0.5, 0.6 Gauss in about five milliseconds. This is the typical time that you have, which is adapted to our trap. So it, it's trap dependent. It depends on the trapping frequencies, okay? Basically, it's one over the trapping frequency. And uh, then we can hold them there for a little while. We did it for over a, a decade here in millisecond time scale. And then we have to release them for taking the snapshots and to see what's going on. That's how we do it. So basically what happens is that when we run this procedure, we invert the field, but not only. The atoms will acquire a 2 MF uh, winding number along the process, and we acquire a 4 H bar angular momentum in the end, which is summarized like that. This is the typical dependence of the field, very close to the, the center. And when you run and you apply the rotation operator to it, you will see that if you start in an F-MF state 
along the z direction not x sorry it's changed over here it's really so it should be x um, you go and you end up with this phase winding here which is the minus e to mf phi okay when you go from the plus from the mf plus 2 to the mf minus 2 which is our case okay um, to understand a little bit what's going on we had we came up with a challenge first we used to study our bcs only by looking at the we making images along a 45 degree angle which was typically like this if you have a, a 3d condensate that looks more or less like this so to uh, we we started seeing something like that but we we felt that well maybe that's not all uh, those are complex structures we should find another way to study then so let's place let's start with a different imaging axis so we can see a bit more so we we ended up finalizing uh, with three different um, actual or three different imaging axes of here so as you can see this is the top bottom this is the x actual and this is the 45 degree um, okay so now I'm going to discuss a little bit the results okay what we started seeing. So if, we if you end up with your BEC and then you release under time of flight, this is typically what you see. You see a large vortex line in the center, which expands in a certain manner, and it also does some fu funny things, like it oscillates, it bends a little bit, so um, it, it may do all kinds of things. In this, I just show you the, the typical pictures. So uh, we were a little bit puzzled how we could explain a that will be explained in any way. And we decided to contact, to help for, we, we went for a, a help from the theoreticians. And it ended up that people from Newcastle was, they were available to help us. And they decided to run a simulation for our system with our system parameters and to see what they will see. Um, and for us, it was remarkable that they, you, in about the same time scales here, they were seeing something that okay, if I integrate those complex structures here, I might be seeing this as I'm uh, as I'm showing you. So it's even more <laughs> amazing that even if you don't do any any scaling at all, it's amazing that I mean, as it it goes off the, the simulation, it's just put on the top of each other without much rescaling. You see uh, similar even size, but it, this is just lucky. But it was interesting to check that out. Um, so if we ask them to do a little bit of dynamics of the system, it, it will start and it will go like this. So we start with your uh, highly charged vortex imprinted on the center. And if you have a little bit of um, uh, some noise in the system, we will see that it will start decaying. If you don't have any noise at all, if you don't put that into the, the, the simulation, the numerics, it will live for forever, let's say, for for the time scales of the experiment, it will be forever, okay? You won't see any, any decay. So you have to perturb a little bit the system, like a, a small displacement in the axis, and then it will start decaying. And it goes like this, okay? It starts, it, it goes fast, quickly to the four vortex, and then it, it does induce some, some surface oscillations as well. Uh, okay, here I, oops, I think I have to click it. So you will see how it goes in a full dynamic picture in the same time scale of the, the experiments, not necessary. So um, it really decays to the singly charged vortex because the energy really tells you that that should be the case, okay? It minimizes the energy by doing that. And, um, and of course, we decided to go a little bit deeper here, like uh, what happens in the center, can we recover the same fluctuations in the atomic density can be recovered in the, uh, in the numeric? Uh, it apparently, yes, but uh, we're not so sure yet. So th there's an evidence, but we need to a little bit be more careful here. For instance, the, um, the normalization of the intensities in the, in the probe beam it should be checked before we go on with this microstructures along the BEC. Uh, moreover, if we hold our BECs 
in the trap or that that weird trap which is anti-trapping along the actual direction and trapping along the radial direction this is what we see we see some oscillations here along the radio and actually that is uh, a little bit of oscillation in the vertical, but you can see it really accelerates, which explains this stretching that you always see here, okay? Um, yeah, and just to show, yeah, we run with these experiments at the typical fraction of 0.5 um, condensed atoms in, the, in this 10 to the 5 typical atom number. So here we compare what we see when we when we keep the condensate in this trap, in this anti-trapping, in the oscillation to see if we have a not yet condensed but very cold sample, how it goes. So it goes parabolic, but again, this this uh, was measured and it's not the gravity, it's, it's about half of the gravity. That's the accel acceleration that you see here. It's about the same in here as it should. So it's a, a trap-dependent acceleration. So now, if instead of keeping it in trap, we just release it under time of flight, this is typically what we see from 10 milliseconds up to 30 milliseconds. That's how these dimensions here along the axis and along the radio go with the field. So apparently, when we perturb our BCs, we never see it again, this typical inversion of the aspect ratio, as we used to call, okay? So this should go much slower, and then this should go fast, and it cross at some point. So apparently when we perturb do by imprinting a vortex or by nucleating a vortex or making turbulence, that's broken and you have this sort of self-similar expansion here. Um, but also it's, it might be just that acceleration that I created since I have this weird uh, anti-trapping potential. So if I track over this time of flight this uh, line width as, as a function of the time of flight, and the healing length, which is a function of the density, which is uh, decreasing as the time goes by, I can also check one information where, uh, where you, you want to know what is the, I mean, I told you about the recipe and the, uh, about the theory that we should end up with a charge at four vortex, but uh, can I check that experimentally? Is there a way to check that? Moreover, in the past, uh, th there were some sort of uh, two different opinions or, or, or visions of how that should go with the winding number. So one tells you that should go more or less linear, as we see from the experiment here. Uh, and that's basically just the ratio of the, healing of the uh, vortex line with the core size, right, and the, uh, and the healing length. And but also, there's a, a new paper from 2010-11, or newer paper, where they say that it should go as a, as a function of the square root of the winding numbers. So, um, so we're, we're more leaning towards the linear behavior. That's what the experiment tells us, but that's still an open question. I think we should go and, and check that out a little bit more. So just for you to have a typical size of these structures in RBC and how we do, th those is what, this is the typical at about 22, 23 milliseconds time of flight. Okay, and we also can check even this helicity or this pitch size, if you like. Okay, we decided not to rely only on that measurement, but also to insist in by, by taking snapshots along the axis to see if eventually you will end up with a, four, a singly charged vortices. And that's what we observe at least at 15 to 20 percent of the, the runs, okay? So it's checked also. Um, uh, the last thing which remains of interesting to show you is that only if we look from the vertical uh, part where the, the probe beam comes along the vertical direction, we see this interesting interference fringes appearing on the on the BEC, which had had not been reported before okay we don't understand them yet we don't uh, we cannot relate we thought first was an interference in between different populations in different spin states which we form when we do the, that rump because we cross the zero and then when we enter the zero we we have a dead 
a degenerate system which might might unfold in a different spin state so but uh, after a little while investigating that that we concluded that that's not the case so there's more to come and to investigate here so I, I think to wrap it up uh, I should just finish by telling you that um, the um, numerical simulations also told us that there's hope we might still start with vortices and end up with turbulence in the end if we prepare the vortices in a, in, in a highly charged, so at least charge two, but it with different circulation, so one has to be plus two and the other has to be minus two. And if you do that, um, you will see that the system should decay and should have uh, reconnections and tangles, so evolving to a turbulent stage, which is not the case if you start with the same circulation in two, which is still also a challenge to us because we don't know exactly how to produce that in the lab. So we do have a recipe, but we don't know how to make it yet, okay? I hope to be telling you more in the next time that I come to, to a meeting like that. But that's just to show you that if they have, you end up with a turbulent state, but you have same circulation, you just decay as you should, okay? So uh, that's the, the partial conclusions I have. So we denucleate the, the charged vortices. That's a very reliable way to produce large, large multi-charged vortices. Uh, a, a picture, the only actual picture where we really show the four singly charged vortices, the first, as, as far as I know, pr uh, even though we didn't present it in the lit, we didn't publish yet, uh, we did observe some interesting process with just the unwinding that most people have been like waving, saying that, well, maybe that's not happening. It is, for sure. It's just not easy to, to see. Um, we, it does depend a lot on the whole time because of this weird shape and potential that we produce. In the lab. It doesn't do some collective modes. You saw some oscillations. And it's very sensitive to any perturbations you might have in the system. But it's also maybe a, an alternative way and m maybe more clean to produce turbulence or tur isotropic turbulence, which there's many people interested in. And we'd like to check what happens and how it goes if we start in different atomic states. Um, maybe use some new technology to produce um, turbulence or even to nuclear divorces based, based on um, SLM modulators where you imprint the, the phase already in the... I think there's, there's more to, to take from there. And especially if we go from our ma current magnetic trap to a purely optical trap, where we can even mixture the spin states and completely understand what's going on, or at least that's our hope. We also may see some cascade and see more thermodynamics properties of the sample. And to finish, to wrap up, I'd like to thank um, the lab people, which is mainly just me and Vanderlei are here, but uh, they did a lot. We have a, a, a wonderful batch of students the last few years, and uh, two of them are already gone. So Pedro is already at Lens, and Franklin, our last PhD student for the year, is going to Yale soon. And we're here, I finish, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you.